We have four amazing speakers, and with that, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Patrick Holt. Now, he is the adult services librarian for Durham County Library, and he's sitting here right next to me. But the first time we saw Patrick, what grabbed us were his amazing designs. He just, when, when he starts to show you some of the work that he's creating, it's just fantastic. The topic, which he will talk about, is also fantastic. But when we started to really listen to his thinking of why he's doing what he's doing and the thinking behind it, we thought, oh my gosh, he has to be part of this webinar. And so, Patrick, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so, yes, as Nancy has already said, my name is Patrick Holt. I'm in Durham County, North Carolina, and I do the um, whoop, mouse. I do the monthly graphic novels and comics newsletter for an adult audience. Um, this newsletter started five years ago, um, although it looks fairly different now. Um, the one on the left you see there is our earlier version, and on the right with the updated um, Nextreads um, template. Um, how it happened is that the uh, chairs of our email marketing committee saw a need to promote uh, adult graphic novels, um, which at that point was an emerging collection that they wanted to boost the circulation of. Um, they asked me to take it on because I'm one of a handful of folks in our system who have made comics a professional priority, and especially for my involvement in our annual Durham Comics Fest. Um, Cultivating this relatively small audience is definitely not spelled out in our strategic plan or a mission statement, so it's really encouraging to me that our tech services and administration uh, want to take care of them as much as I do. Um, since our starting place was a specific collection, featuring, or I'm sorry, uh, figuring out our audience was the easy part. Um, it was active and potential readers of the graphic novel collection for adults. We already had very good coverage of most of our other broad collections through email and other promotional methods, so we could afford to specialize a little bit and make this push. Um, and while promoting the collection is the primary function for the newsletter, I also use it to promote more comics-related events in the library and elsewhere, including book clubs, drawing groups, um, other local conventions, and that sort of a thing. And then ultimately the goal is to help make um, a vibrant community of comics readers and uh, creators as well. Um, very quickly, I want to run down the bits and pieces of my newsletter um, that I think accomplish um, or help accomplish some of the, the stuff I'm talking about. Uh, the first one is the I start all of them with a banner image at the top just to catch folks' eye. Um, and any excuse to make the thing pretty. Um, secondly, I always include a table of contents, which is definitely not necessary, but it helps let them know what information is below the fold, whether they're looking at it through email or through um, a static URL. Um, I also, as you see toward the right there, give a little personal introduction so that they know it's from a real person who cares about comics just like they do. And I include my contact information as well, so if they ever want to reach out, they are hopefully feeling welcome to do that. Um, and then at the bottom, you see the sort of main thrust of it, which is new comics in our adult collection. Um, further down the list, um, I have selections to go with my colleague's graphic book club. Each month, he chooses a theme rather than a particular title, so that always makes it easy. In this case, I've got science fiction. Um, to, uh, to add more titles to go with, with uh, his club. And then below that, you can see I have a dedicated spot to promote his book club every month. Um, below this, I have events, those events I was talking about in the library and beyond. Here you can see there's a couple other book clubs around town that have nothing to do with the library. And then at the bottom, it's a local uh, drawing group that meets once a month and has a loose affiliation with the library. Um, and then finally, um, all of our newsletters include this uh, chunk toward the top there about um, the other reader's advisory services that we option, 
And then I like to include an archive so that new folks can find previous issues and additions, rather, and uh, other topics that might interest them. Um, I also use this structure to promote our Durham Comics Fest every year. Um, and what that means is that I can reach people who I know are already interested in receiving this kind of information because they have expressed an interest in the topic, but I can also add other folks from, I have a separate list of contacts and I don't have to obligate them to subscribing if they uh, don't want to. Um, so Nextreads is the only email marketing provider I have worked with, but I think the features that I've run through show what I like about it. And for me, that mostly comes down to flexibility and reliability. So everything that you have seen on, on these slides is where I chose to put it and exactly how I chose to make it look. And Nextreads delivers that layout to email and, like I said earlier, posts it to a dedicated URL. Um, and, and I can rely on it looking that way. Um, I also appreciate that it manages subscriber emails and records statistics, and it uh, communicates well with our catalog and gathers book covers as well, because these are all things that are vital to creating and distributing the newsletter. Um, but I also want to note that building an audience has also depended on flyering and displays and word of mouth and a lot of one-on-one -on -one connections just uh, with patrons in the building. So. Like most things at the library, you can't just quite wind it up and watch it go. It, it um, takes support as well, which I'm happy to do. Um, but I'm also I'm really proud of the work, and I'm very proud to say that my newsletter won an ALA PR Exchange Award this year. I'm also very proud to say that my um, open rate for these emails is in the high 30%, which I've been told is a good measure of success. Um, but I also know, based on one-on-one -on -one conversations I've had with subscribers, that it's reaching people, and that makes me feel very good about the work. Um, I would be very happy to talk more about the newsletter and everything, so please feel free to ask questions at the end of the webinar or contact me anytime you'd like. Perfect. That's really great, um, Patrick. Thank you. Um, there are some questions about the difference between constant contact and MailChimp, who uses MailChimp. So one of the things that we've asked our people to talk about today isn't so much about the platform, but more of if you're looking at email platforms, what are some of the things that you want to make sure that you have or what makes it work for you? So um, we can answer quest those bigger questions at the end, but um, I just wanted to point that out. Patrick, that was really great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Kathy Lucier, who will be presenting Kim. And as I said earlier, Kathy is part of the LibraryWare team. She's our customer engagement manager. She uh, works with probably everybody that's online. She probably knows all of you personally. Um, Kathy? Thanks, Nancy. And thank you, Patrick. Well, next up is Kim Cashman. She is Reference Services Supervisor at the Mishawaka Penn Harris Public Library in Mishawaka, Indiana. Well, I've been a fan and a subscriber to one of her library's newsletters for a little while now, Books in the National Media, and she's going to talk about that one um, in particular. In fact, earlier this year, I worked with a library that was thinking about creating a similar newsletter so I connected them with Kim's team, and now that library has a Books in the National Media newsletter too. Sounds like we might have a trend on our hands. Well, that newsletter is a little bit of a chicken and the egg story, and I can't wait for Kim to share it with you, plus a few other great marketing tips. So Kim, take it away. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'm Kim Cashman. and. Um, from Mishawaka Penn Harris Public Library, and we serve the Penn and Harris Townships in northern Indiana. We serve a population of 89,000 roughly, <clears throat> which is 93% urban. And we have three, three different locations with um, very different, um, very different fields. Um, 
and very different demographics. Our Mishawaka Library is located right in the downtown um, area of the city of Mishawaka. Our Bittersweet Branch is located in a more rural area and serves many young families. And Harris Branch is located in the suburban area and tracks many people associated with the University of Notre Dame and many other um, institutions of higher education in our, in our area. Although there are subscribers to the books in the national media newsletter from all three locations, a majority are from the Harris branch. And you'll see that in our, the slide all the way on the right. Um, uh, before describing the target audience, I'll just say basically what this list does. Um, the list gathers from many different websites books that have appeared on national TV and radio programs. Um, the target audience for this newsletter um, is serious readers who keep up with current issues and events and current popular fiction. And they're, they're basically patrons interested in recent materials that are creating a buzz. And the choice of this audience was purely patron driven. Um, this means that we selected this topic due to questions we got at our desk. And here was the, situations, uh, the situation that arose. Patrons asked questions about books they heard about on NPR or saw in morning TV programs. If someone is driving to work and listening to NPR or perhaps watching TV in the morning over breakfast, they don't necessarily have a pen and paper handy. So they would come looking for these books that they'd heard about with incomplete information. So our newsletter, first of all, serves people who were interested in, in reading these books that were creating national media interest. And also, it serves our staff who um, can now more easily help patrons locate these books in our library. Um, finally, it is also very useful for our collection development um, and, uh, and the purchasing of books. We know which books are, are popular and which books people are talking about. And briefly, how the list came about is uh, shortly after I started at MPHPL, we began creating, creating recommended reads lists for our website. And Books in the National Media became um, a website list due to the situation that I just described. And the screenshot is an image of our um, recent um, Books in the National Media um, recommended reads list. Because it was a popular list, Sarah Feldbaum recommended turning it into a newsletter as well when we started doing newsletters not very long ago. And she has been creating this newsletter weekly ever since. Now, how this fits in with our strategic plan, um, the newsletter really does relate to three particular goals that our 2015, 2017, the 2017 strategic plan mentions. Um, our first goal is to increase circulation. Uh, second, provide useful content on the website for patrons. And third, increase awareness of multiple formats. And the point of the latter is that we began offering a wide variety of digital, um, digital books, but also um, e-audio books, download, downloadable audio books, streaming audio books. And we wanted to make patrons aware that these were available and our newsletter, um, and here's a, a, just a screenshot of part of our recent newsletter, um, not only has the, the cover and the description of the book, but a note saying where the item appeared, and then also that you can find it as an ebook as well. And then why is for yesterday shows that it is also available as a downloadable audio book. And Sarah has organized it so that clicking on those links will bring you right to that format in our catalog. So other tools for reaching this audience of 
eager readers and people who are interested in current events and fiction that's creating a stir. Um, in addition to our recommended reads list, which I just mentioned, we also have um, four book clubs across our three locations. And we have also been creating bookmarks in, in library wear of recent popular fiction and nonfiction. And here is uh, an example of a very recent bookmark, the Hot New Fall Reads 2017. And those are just books that recently came in um, that, that uh, by well-known authors that we think people would be interested in. And these bookmarks are extremely popular. In terms of features that are useful for um, this newsletter, like everywhere, um, staff time is extremely valuable. We have a smallish number of staff trying to accomplish really a lot. And so one feature that was important to us is ease of use. And we found in creating the newsletter, it's so easy to just search for a title, click on it, and boom, you have a nice layout with the, the dust jacket and a description. Um, and you can set it up so it's already divided into, into sections. Um, so the ease of use to save staff time is, was seriously an important feature for us. Another feature, since we are interested in the, um, making patrons aware of new formats that we have, are the direct links to the catalog so that people can click on the link and go straight to our catalog. And our library is, is very interested in, in branding. That's a very important thing to us. And we think it's wonderful that the newsletters are not generic but include the library brand. And in conclusion, is it worth it? Um, and I would say that, um, from anecdotal evidence, yes, because we are already creating the information for bookmarks and for our, our lists on the website, creating the newsletter adds very little staff time. Um, it can also be done um, in quiet times on the desk. It does save staff time finding books and collecting books. Um, we have not been doing this for very long, um, but um, we have a smallish number of subscribers that is increasing steadily. And we've done some tweaks and changes to, to where our sign up is available, uh, our sign up for the newsletters is available on our website, and that's made a huge difference. Um, from what we can tell, it does seem to create, increase patron demand, although that is that is somewhat hard to quantify. But in some, what really seems to make it worthwhile is that we can use the same information to reach people through, um, through different channels, both the website and the emails and the bookmarks. Um, so we're, we're saving ta staff time and using one effort to create many different ways of reaching out. And and thank you very much for your time. If you have questions or would like to follow up on any of this, you can reach me at kcashman at, at mphpl.org. Thank you. Great. Kim, that was excellent. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from someone that was asking that, are the newsletters searchable? Were you referencing the newsletters or were you re referencing the um, web page? Oh. Yeah, um, so when people receive the newsletters in their email, there are live links in the newsletter that will send them to the catalog. Perfect. So okay. the newsletter itself isn't searchable, but it does have live links to our catalog. Right. So that yeah. saves people actually doing a catalog search. They could say, ooh, that sounds interesting, and click on the link in the newsletter and get directly to that entry in our catalog. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then um, this is for everybody as you come up to your time to talk. Do any of you integrate social media in the newsletters? And if so, how? Um, 
So that, that's something you may want to think about. We've, we've been playing with that here at Novelist as well. With what would that look like? What's really a good use case of um, promoting content from an email? Um, and then the other thing I did want to say about Kim was that when we, were, when we were talking, I think one of the exciting things about what Kim did was this whole concept of they were already creating this content and then how else can they get that out to their audience? And it just makes me think of how many of you might have content that's sitting on your website and yet uh, never really thought about, gee, maybe we can take a proactive stance in getting that content out to an audience through email. So something that you may want to think about. Um, our next speaker is Jez Lehman. So Jez is the Adult Services Library for Indian Prairie Public Library in Illinois. And one of the things that struck us about what Jez was doing was she was reaching two audiences, one which is the absolute favorite audiences of libraries, and the other is an audience that libraries are always striving to reach. And so the first would be people looking for jobs, um, and the second is the 20s and 30s group of people, and I think both approaches that she has done with her newsletter is, is something that all of us might uh, learn something from. So Jez, um, welcome. Thank you. So uh, like she said, I am working with two very different communities. So I'm working with, um, I'm going to say millennials, but I do mean the 20 and 30 somethings. I realize not everyone falls into that millennial category and then job hunters. And I have here screenshots of each one. And so not only are these very different communities, but we treat them very differently because we need to work with what will reach that group. What do they most care about? So on the left, we have the Job and Careers newsletter. And on the right, we have Lib Social, which is our programming series for 20 and 30 somethings. And this is the e-news that goes with it. So I'll start with the Job and Careers. So this target audience is job hunters, um, also people that are in their career, maybe looking to move forward and you know get a promotion, something like that, but mostly focusing on the job hunting portion. Uh, it does get sent out monthly to um, about 130 subscribers right now, and it does have an average open rate of 37%, which I'm very happy with. Um, so it uses upcoming programs, and on the right there you can see we just finished up Job Prep Week, which was a whole week of job hunting programs, so I was able to promote those through this newsletter. I put in recent job hunting books, current job openings at the library, which is by far the most clicked on link in the newsletter, and then I also do a spotlight on databases and other resources that we think would help the job hunters. Because at programs, I always hear people asking about, you know, I didn't know you offered this. Uh, I didn't know we could use this for job hunting. So we're trying to use that spotlight to really promote these um, resources so people know that they can use them to their advantage. So how we built the list, and I see that question in the chat also, um, I advertised it at job and career programs. And by advertised, I mean, that at every program, especially in the last week, I would go up and you know, talk for a minute, here are the upcoming programs, here's what we offer for job hunters, and we have a monthly e-news. You can sign up for that and get regular information in your newsletter or in your inbox. And I would put out a physical sign-up sheet at the program so people could write down their name and their email address, and then I would physically enter those later because it saves the time of the user, basically. It takes me 10 minutes to enter all the emails that I get, but I, I don't have to rely on people remembering where to go later. Maybe they lose the link, they forget about it, they don't know how to do it themselves. So all they have to do is write down their email address and then I can do that for them. Uh, so the subscriber count for this one does fluctuate. And this is the one where I'm not mad at all when people unsubscribe because they're unsubscribing because they no longer need the e-news because they've gotten a job. 
So when people unsubscribe, I actually take that as a win because it means that I've done a good job. Uh, so is it worth it to offer this newsletter? I think absolutely. We really wanted to reach job hunters where they were at and let them know about any new programs and services rather than waiting for them to come to us to ask for something that we could you know, be a little bit more consistent, let them know what we already offer. And you know, it would, it's great that we don't have to hear as often, I didn't know you offered this. Uh, so sending an email does help us market our, prom our programs and our services without waiting for the patron to come to us. It does increase our attendance at programs. It lets people know about the new releases that, you know, there aren't very many job hunting books anymore. So it's great that we can market these and let people know what we do have and maybe boost our circulation a little bit. Uh, the features that I use, and for this I am using LibraryWare. So we do have special mailing lists. Uh, my library, Indian Prairie, offers a lot of e-news offerings through LibraryWare. So this allows us to set up a very specific sign up only for job hunters. And we get those metrics that we were talking about in the chat earlier to see the number of subscribers, to see the open rate, to see what people have clicked on. That's one of the um, things that I like best, that I can see which links people have used so that I know what content they're looking for, what works best for them. So I know to tell them about jobs at the library. That's what people are looking for. Um, it wasn't, sorry, it is in our strategic plan. We wanted to offer more job and career related services and make people aware of them and boost attendance and usage. And that's what we've been able to do with our newsletter. Uh, like we talked about earlier, it's all things that we were offering already. Now we just have them all in one place you get it in your inbox every month, it's nice and easy. So on a very different end of the spectrum, uh, we have Live Social for the 20 and 30 somethings. So this gets sent out to almost 6,000 subscribers. And the target audience is people in their 20s and 30s. It goes out once a month. Um, I generally time it a couple of days before the first program of the month because it gives a good bump in registration and people in this group, they don't make a lot of plans very far ahead. I can say that I'm also in that age range, um, but generally a couple of days ahead gives us time to make plans, know what our schedule looks like. So it's great to know that I can use this to really boost the, uh, the registration at programs. So it is sent out to over, um, 5,800 subscribers. Uh, I've got about a 17 to 20% open rate for these, which is in line with the average, but it still accounts for about 900 viewers for every e-news, and to me, that's a huge win. It includes information on upcoming programs. Uh, we have a special book club for 20 and 30 something called Gen Lit, and I'll put um, all of the um, meeting information in there with a link to the book in the catalog, as well as information on where we meet in town each month. And I put uh, new books that we think will interest this age group. Some of those come from our Gen Lit collection, which is like the new adults. Some of it is graphic novels, some science fiction. I try to mix it up and get a good variety for everyone. So how we built the list, so to get that almost 6,000, uh, I do advertise it at programs, just like I do with the job hunting one. I'll mention it at the beginning of every program. I do about two a month. Um, we get a lot from the evaluations from the program. So at the end, people will tell us what they're interested in, and then they have an option to write the newsletter at the bottom. And again, this just helps save time with the user. They can write it down in the moment, and I personally will enter them later. But the main reason that we got all of these is because we created a limited opt-out system, which means that basically we ran a report of all of the cardholders in our district who fell between the ages of 19 and 40, who had given us their email addresses, and then we automatically added them to our Library Aware newsletter. And they always have the ability to opt out later, and many of them do, but the large majority of them do say, stay subscribed. They may not always open it, but when they see the headline of the newsletter, they can decide every month, does this apply to me? Am I interested? 
and they always have that option to read them. So we're still getting in their inbox, which is the first battle. Uh, so this is something that I know not, not a lot of libraries have done, and it was something that we had a long discussion about beforehand where, for they did not specifically sign up for this newsletter. How can we get these emails? Is it okay for us to use these? And we decided ultimately that when people give us their email addresses, we're already signing them up for the library e-news, which is a lot more general. And, you know, they've already basically opted into receiving emails. And this way, we're reaching that specific group, and they do always have the option to opt out later. So we are giving them a choice. So again, that's a limited opt-out system. Uh, and it has really worked out great. A lot of people stay signed up and they keep opening it. So I think it's great. Uh, so a lot of newsletters are a lot more formal. They come from the library. Uh, LibSocial is very different than that. It's very casual. Readers know that it comes from me specifically. There's a more personal feel. They know that they can respond to any email, even if it's just to compliment a good picture. Uh, I like to throw in a lot of memes. I use funny titles in the email uh, titles. I use a lot of in-jokes, references to TV shows. I like to keep it very casual and friendly and use first person rather than making it more formal. So here you can see example of some of the, you know, memes and pictures I use. This one was all about the 90s night coming up, so I tried to make everything 90s themed. And I have a lot of fun trying to find all the pictures when I make the newsletter. I probably spend a little bit too much time on that, but it's fun for me. Uh, so I can use the statistics from Library Aware. I can also use a lot of statistics from my evaluation of the program, which told me that 16% of program attendees do hear about it from the e-news. So that's actually my second biggest referral source, second only to word of mouth. Um, in the email features I use, again, the special mailing list. I like to track the um, click statistics to help me see what topics were most interesting. So using the creative titles for the events, does that work better than just using the basic descriptive titles we would normally use? Or are they more interested in art programs than video game programs? It kind of helps me decide what people are interested in more than just who is coming to the program. Uh, I also use the statistics to justify the programs, which was very helpful when presenting it to the director and the board, that I have some hard numbers that show I use this, e this email, this is how many people I reach, this is how well it works. I have that kind of hard data which I can use in addition to the anecdotal data. And yeah, it's also a good way to justify your budget. That I know that we're all very tight on money, but I can say, here's a group that is very large in our community. They need some attention, you know, help me reach them. So that's what I did here. So again, here's my contact information. Uh, it's Indian Prairie Library. If you go to the libsocial.ipl.info, you can see the actual LibSocial e-news as well as a archive of all of the past months. Jez, that was great. Um, Kathy is going to introduce our last speaker for the day. Oh, great. And thanks, Jez. That was really interesting. Well, up next is Catherine Coles. And Catherine is the manager of library services and she's county librarian for the county of Lennox and Addington in Eastern Ontario. Well, Catherine has mastered the concept of taking advantage of a captive audience. I'm gonna let her tell you all about that trick and a few others she has up her sleeve for connecting readers with books. Now, Catherine's not the only one in the Coles household who loves to review books. You can see her partner in crime here, her adorable dog, Poochie, has gotten into the act, posing with her favorite books on Instagram, at Adventures with Poochie. And I'm gonna post that for you. Um, if you're not following that pup, you're missing out on some great books and really cute puppy pics. 
So here's Catherine Coles to tell us all about it. Catherine? <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Kathy, for the Pucci shout out. Um, so um, our Camlet newsletter is something I started in June 2014. It is a monthly newsletter, and it's one of five newsletters that we send out to our users. And it's all about promoting Canadian books and authors. It's also worth mentioning that um, the content of this newsletter is entirely books, as well as aimed at an adult audience. Um, so I wanted to start by telling you a bit about my library. We serve approximately 42,000 people across six branches in the County of Lennox and Addington. And it's in eastern Ontario, about halfway between Toronto and Ottawa. And we're best described as urban rural because we serve a mix of good-sized towns as well as some small hamlets and large stretches that are entirely rural. And like most of our patrons have wide and diverse reading preferences that we try to represent in our collections and readers' advisory promotions. Um, we decided to create a newsletter that specifically targeted Canlit readers for a number of reasons. First of all, there is an emphasis on Canadian content in our collection development policy. As well, it's part of our mandate to foster Canadian culture in our communities. And this is not uncommon among a lot of Canadian libraries. And I imagine there are equivalent examples of certain libraries elsewhere prioritizing regional, regional or local, local authors. Um, the majority of books we get into our library, uh, new books, I mean, are written by authors from the US or the UK. But we still receive about 10 to 20 um, new Canadian books a week. So it's a small collection, but we single it out using these little Canadian flag spine labels, which are also very common among Canadian libraries. So it's a small collection, but it's a visible collection. Um, another reason we started a Canlit newsletter is a bit more obvious in that there is local interest and demand for Canadian content. Um, Lennox and Addington is, is a growing arts community, and there's a lot of local writers and um, arts groups that are very supportive of local and Canadian content, and they, um, they seek it out. Interest is also generated as a result of other initiatives. So, for example, we participate in the Evergreen Award, which is a project of the Ontario Library Association's Forrester Reading Program. And it is essentially an annual long list of Canadian books that library patrons from across Ontario can vote on to choose the winner. And um, programs like this really help us create an appetite for Canadian content. Another example, um, Canada just had its 150th birthday. So a lot of organizations, and us included, decided to capitalize on the buzz by doing a Canadian reading challenge. So it had a lot of patrons reading all sorts of Canadian books and wanting ideas for other areas of Canlet to explore, and that's what um, this Canlet newsletter accomplishes. So I don't know if there's an agreed upon definition for Canlet, but decades ago, it mostly referred to literary fiction that was set in Canada and written by a Canadian author, and there is usually like a rural lean to it. Um, but these days, the definition seems to have expanded. So now it includes plenty of genre fiction, non-Canadian-born authors living in Canada, and Canadian-born authors living abroad. And um, whether the book is actually set in Canada is pretty relevant. Um, and luckily, this, this lends a lot of diversity to creating a Canlet newsletter, because otherwise, I wouldn't have enough content to do it on a monthly basis anyway. Um, so I'm able to conclude a little bit of something for everyone. Um, I try to split the titles included between literary fiction and genre fiction, and um, big name authors balanced with more obscure or debut authors. And um, so I think the, the newsletter is representative of what Canlet has to offer readers, and it, it, as well as it's a good mix for, um, for our subscribers. Um, another thing to mention with this slide, um, with Libraryware, you can see how a newsletter has been successful using click-through stats. Um, this is people clicking through to the title to access it in your library's catalog. And um, I use this to inform future choices of books to include. So for example, Louise Penny, she's um, at the top of that example newsletter there. Um, she's a big name, very prolific author. She has a book a year. Um, so I know from the past she gets a lot of click-throughs. So I'll put her, her books first in the newsletter in order to, to capture readers' attention right off the bat and um, to encourage them to, to keep scrolling through. Um, also, um, cover art is another thing I should talk about. 
Often Canadian and American cover art is the same, especially if the author has been commercially successful in the United States um, and a new book is being released at the same time on both sides of the border. Um, however, it's not always the same, and sometimes it takes a while for a Canadian book to receive an, an American release, assuming that it ever does. Uh, so with Libraryware, you can upload Canadian book covers to replace American editions if that's important to you. I don't really normally worry about that. Um, but more importantly, if, um, if it's an obscure title or a book without an ISBN, and it's not represented in, in the catalog, Library Wars catalog, um, you can upload cover art and add in a synopsis where they're unavailable. So there's a lot of flexibility in that way. We don't spend a lot of time marketing our newsletter, but the methods that we do use are pretty easy and they're relatively effective. So the image on the left, that is a mini form that frontline staff will slip into books that have that little Canadian flag label, and they'll do this upon checkout. And it really allows us to, um, to target users who are already reading Canlet. And um, on the slip, the patrons are prompted to either visit our website, and they're given instructions to access LibraryWare's opt-in page, or they can just return the form directly to the staff member with their contact info, and then I can sign them up at a later date from the uh, admin platform. We also use um, newsletter opt and newsletter opt-in right in our library card registration form. And um, this works on a few levels. I mean, first of all, it's a captive audience. They're already providing us with their information. And um, it doesn't really require any extra effort on their part to sign up other than just putting a check in the box. Um, the other piece, and uh, I don't know if it's relevant for everybody, but Canada has anti-spam legislation that imposes restrictions on email communications for marketing purposes and I'm sure maybe other jurisdictions have similar requirements. But um, we need to have the consent of patrons before sending them promotional newsletters. And um, having expressed consent with their signature right here on the page, it goes above and beyond what we're, what we're required to do. So we're ensuring we're, we're, we're compliant and protected. And um, also library, library words opt-in form is also obviously compliant. And um, the newsletter itself is compliant because among other reasons, it's, um, it's easy for someone to uh, subscribe, which is another important requirement of the legislation. So finally, I wanted to talk a bit about metrics. Um, we currently have 261 subscribers for our Canlet newsletter, which doesn't seem like a whole lot, but it is a niche subject, of course. And um, to put it in perspective, the Canlet newsletter has more subscribers than our romance newsletter. The, uh, the open rate is approaching 40%, which I understand isn't too shabby. And the click-through rate for title I find especially useful, as I said. Um, and it shows me the direct impact of the promotion, um, which is people clicking through to the catalog, uh, presumably placing a hold, and um, hopefully reading the book. And in 2017, we had 62 new subscribers and one unsubscribe. And I think the lack of unsubscribes tells me that at least most people are appreciating what they're seeing. And that's, uh, that's why I continue to do it. And that's all I have. And thank you for listening. And feel free to contact me with any questions. Catherine, that's excellent. Excellent. Thank you. This is Nancy again. Um, great comments and thoughts from everyone in the audience as we move along. I thought maybe we could take a couple of minutes just to, to talk about some terms that we use when we talk about metrics for library, uh, for emails, and how people measure. So the first thing that, the first thing for metrics that people like to measure is how many people actually open your emails. And we, we look at a unique open rate. That means that we count every time that you open the email one time gets one count. So if I send it to 50 people and one person opens that 500 times, it still only counts as one open rate. So if you send out to 50 people and you have an open rate of 50%, it means that 25 people actually open that email. Okay. The second important um, metric that we measure and that you want to measure too is what we call the um, click rate. Now, most marketers use what they call a click-through rate. 
And what most marketing people try to do is figure out, if I send an email and I can get one click on that email, so one person opens it and that person clicks, that's what they're trying to achieve. And so they count unique clicks. With us, we tend to encourage libraries to think in terms of open clicks. And what that means is every click that you have on that email, because normally the way that you're putting together an email might be different books, um, might be different events. And so when you measure an email, what you're really trying to check on your click rate is what are they interested in. So um, if I have an event and I have three books, did you click on all four things or did you just click on one thing? Did you just click on the books and not the events? So we look at open click rates but unique open rates. Okay. Um, the other thing I did want to point out on this is we talked about opt-in and opt-out. So the way that that works for you, I put the definition in opt-out. So what most libraries do is they do an opt-in, which means we're going to promote the email. You tell us either verbally or sign up on a form or tell us um, up on a website that please subscribe us to this newsletter. And that's a pretty traditional way of creating newsletters uh, list, and it works pretty well. The opt-out system is the idea that says um, we're going to create, we're going to send you, we're going to pull all these emails and we're going to send them to everybody and we're going to let you know we'll be sending you emails and encourage you to opt out if this is not what you're interested in. More and more libraries are using this format because what they find is that their patrons want to hear from them and so the opt-out rate is less. That is a personal decision for your library. Both work, but the opt-out is essential if you are going to, um, it's essential to have a place where you can opt out. For, for us in Library Wear, that is mandated. Every email that gets created has a section on the bottom that has unsubscribe that allows you to go someplace to unsubscribe. Your email provider also provides that because that's the law. Unless you're doing something in Outlook, um, you should have that. So opt-in, opt-out, um, metrics for what you're doing, and I think those are pretty much the terminology. Um, if I understand correctly, the opt-out method um, wouldn't fly legally in Canada. Yes, thank you, Michael, for mentioning that. So Canada has very strict restrictions that you must opt in. Uh, you must say, please send me this. So that's correct. Anyone in Canada, it should be the opt-in process. Now there's some place in the States as well. When we were working on our pilot program for the email, I think there was a place out Midwest, Kansas maybe, that actually had very stringent. So do check your laws to make sure that your um, following them. So let's see, any other questions? Um, we haven't done that, we put out. So Jess, you had mentioned that you had worked with MailChimp and Constant Contact. Would you mind talking a little bit about um, those two platforms? You don't have to get into too much details, but you know, people were curious about those as well. Sure. Yeah, I used uh, MailChimp for a bi-weekly newsletter through a website that I run. So I do it in my personal time, not through the library. Uh, I do like it because it's very modular and you can kind of bring things where you need them, move it around so it's not one strict template every time. You can save templates, but you can change them however you need to. I like that I have a lot of control over the format, the fonts, the colors. So it was very easy to get that. You do get some statistics, but because I was using MailChimp and LibraryWare at the same time in different capacities, a lot of times I would find myself sitting there thinking like, oh, I wish I was using LibraryWare. Is there a way I can use that for my personal work too? <laughs> uh, so LibraryWare I like because it is a lot more visual, and I do think that brings in a lot more readers, but it's also easier to use 
um, because it is so visual. I like that it pulls in from novelist. Uh, someone else mentioned this in their presentation. It saves a lot of time that we can just type in the title or the author and it brings up the book. It automatically links to our catalog. It has the cover picture there. It has an annotation there. I don't have to do any of that work. So I like that. It does have a searchable image database that I can use a lot of things from. We do occasionally use other resources so we can find other pictures and as we add our own graphics, but it is nice to just use that searchable database as well. Um, the stats are very easy to find. And at Indian Prairie, we kind of use LibraryAware for everything. <laughs> we have over 300 bibliographies and those are all on our website. And the website pages for each one is basically a LibraryWare widget. So they all have the information and they link to our catalog. And then because we have those set up as newsletters, we can pull them in to make promotional items as well. So we can just automatically pull that in to make a bookmark, to make a poster. We don't have to recreate the work every time. So if you're doing, you know, promotional materials and newsletters, it's nice to have it all in one place. For Constant Contact, I don't have as much experience. I was trained on it. This is what we use for our general library newsletter. So I never actually ended up using it because very shortly after we got library aware, um, I found it a little bit harder to use because it's less visual. Uh, it's very, I would say strict in a way. And all of the links you had to add manually, you had to get the links from the catalog, that sort of thing. So it, I feel like it took more time that I could have been using somewhere else. But I do know that a lot of people use it. It's very easy to opt in. You can sign up for it very easily. And we do still use it for our library e-news. So we do use both. Excellent. Thanks, Jez. Listen, um, I just asked Lori to put the Book Squad uh, link. So for those of you who don't know, our uh, librarians here at Novelist have created an amazing series of emails around reader's advisory, uh, curating lists for books, different audiences. It's called the Book Squad. And the reason why I mention this here is that someone had mentioned about teachers. Um, they have a mailing list specifically for teachers uh, that you can get different ideas on. I think it's also worthwhile to look at because they take uh, readers' advisory and trending topics up for readers. They put some fabulous context around that, and it's just super interesting reading. And I think that would also inspire anybody who's uh, looking to reach targeted audiences, whether they're readers or even um, event-based. Um, and Sarah is talking about that she has about 70 subscribers. It's slow going, but they tell each uh, teacher in person to come to the library. There's a lot on their website. I think what each of the presenters talked about was that whole idea of word of mouth, um, talking in front of your, pro, you know, cross-promoting your program. A newsletter doesn't quote unquote sell itself. You have to really talk with your people, uh, connect it to your programming. Um, what other things, Patrick? Um, you, you do all of your events? Yep, um, and honestly, just keeping an eye out for who's browsing in the section that's relevant to me. Right, right. So Jessica asked a question about how easy it's to manage mailing lists in Constant Contact versus Library Where. If anyone has that, that would be great. I think what's important to remember about your mailing list is that as we all get more sophisticated in our emails and we start looking at targeted email lists, those lists can be very small. I mean, we're talking about some of those lists as small as 100, 130 people, sometimes less. And also the idea that um, people may come in, come in and come out of those interest groups. So when we were talking about the people looking for work, that list is really built on people just only coming in at that point of need and moving out. And so in those cases, remember, it's really important to have some place where people can see all of your offerings in an opt-in page on your website so they can see at their point of need what is it that they're interested in. Thanks, 
each of my speakers for coming. I hope that everyone who attended has something that they'll walk away with of value. And again, thank you for speaking. Great presentation.